Hello, everyone. Welcome back to my channel. Thank you so much for joining us for another conversation with Scott Reiter. Uh, you know what to do, just in case. Follow me on Locals, join the community there, and also join my mailing list. Every other link, including to Scott's books, also the channel where you can see Scott interviewing um, his guests, you can find down below this video. And thank you so much, Scott, for finding time to join me. You're on the trip, I'm on the trip, but here we are. Well, thanks for having me. <laughs> thank you, Scott. So I want to start with uh, Poland. Because two days ago, Polish Prime Minister Morawiecki has extended until the February 28th next year the security alert, which is Bravo, and um, Charlie SRP. So it says that Bravo is the second highest of four security alerts and might be introduced when there is an increased threat of an event of a terrorist nature or when such a threat is anticipated, but the target of the potential attack has not been identified. And it also covers police, Polish energy infrastructure, which is located outside of the country. Charlie CRP alert is the third highest of four security alerts introduced in event of terrorist threats that concerns public administration. Um, so this is like a cyber attack, I believe, the Charlie one. Scott, I would like to know your thoughts. Um, why Polish Prime Minister would be doing such a thing? I mean, frankly speaking, only he can answer that question. Um, look, Poland's in a very difficult situation right now. They, um, they helped instigate a crisis in Ukraine. And uh, the crisis has not unfolded in a manner that is beneficial to Poland. Um, they have a energy crisis, they have an economic crisis, they have a political crisis, and that's just at home. They have a refugee crisis that's only going to get worse. And then they have um, an internal um, domestic crisis that revolves around the empowerment of Polish nationalists who somehow view the devolving situation in Ukraine is an opportunity uh, for Poland to um, reacquire um, the territory that's currently known as West Ukraine. Um, and this is you know, problematic. It, it's, it's, it's something that I think resonates emotionally with a segment of Polish population and therefore the politicians that come from this segment, but it's an unrealistic and indeed self-destructive uh, trend. Um, all of which, when you combines, creates a, um, a system of uh, you know, a, a crisis situation in Poland. Um, and, and political leaders oftentimes respond to crisis situations by um, diverting attention away or excusing the crisis as a form of you know, a, a security threat and things of that nature. I, I don't know what intelligence he has received about specific terrorist incidents uh, or, you know, potential. Um, is it real? Uh, is it imagined? Is it uh, manufactured? Um, you know, Europe, <laughs> the European Parliament just voted in a non-binding fashion to call uh, Russia a state sponsor of terrorism. So maybe um, they're using that designation as a uh, justification for uh, elevating terror alert. I, I don't know. What I do know is that it's not conducive. These actions on the part of Poland aren't conducive to resolving the crisis that has emerged from the Ukrainian conflict. Um, in fact, it, it'll seek to exacerbate uh, the conflict uh, rather than try to cure it. Okay, so do you think that creating this extension could be a false flag for the Polish citizens to give them this idea, this illusion um, <laughs> that there, there is such a threat, okay? And then creating that threat to respond to that threat. Um, I mean, yes, I, 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 what, I, what I really think it is, is it's an excuse. It, 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 it puts the Polish citizens in a mindset, uh, an emergency mindset mm -hmm. that allows the Polish government to implement um, security mechanisms 
that are designed, I believe, to control yes. the Polish public. Yes. Uh, because things are going to get tough in Poland. And the government does want to say, oh, well, we think you might riot in the streets because of energy shortages or this, that, and the other thing. Um, so we're going to put troops in the streets. The Polish citizens will say, no, you can't do that. But if they say, no, we have a heightened terrorist threat alert, uh, everybody needs to be scared, there should be concerned, and we're simply doing these security measures for your protection, the mm -hmm. Polish citizens might be more inclined to um, mm -hmm. accept that. Mm -hmm. Exactly, because they want to stay in power. As long Everybody as wants possible. to stay in power. Mm -hmm. So Scott, I would like to ask you, because as you know, like I, I'm actually on the road. Um, I haven't been following daily as I used to all the updates with Ukraine, but I would like to ask you about that situation with electric grid, um, Russia destroying the power and water infrastructure. How much of this has been already destroyed percentage wise? Do you have an idea at this point? And what do you think, how far this will go? Because of course this will create a massive refugees uh, wave like massive wave, but what, what's the situation with this right now? If you can give us updates on this. Well, I mean, it's hard because the, you know, we don't get specific targeting information from the Russians. They don't, uh, they don't say, you know, we struck this facility with this battle damage assessment, et cetera. What we get is rough, uh, rough estimates. Um, I think the numbers right now fluctuate between 40% and 70% of the Ukrainian uh, grid being taken out, um, you know, there, it, you know, it, sometimes it surges to seventy percent. Then repairs are made, and it drops back down to forty percent. Then new strikes take place. But the um, the important thing people need to understand is there's a cumulative effect of the strikes. Um, that uh, first of all, damage is now being done on on Ukrainians' power grid that cannot be repaired. It's permanent damage irreversible damage. The other thing is where it can be repaired, <clears throat> the Ukrainians are, are, are running out of repair components and, uh, and, and spare mm -hmm. capacity. There's a lot of struggle right now to uh, redirect energy supplies from uh, neighboring countries to provide, but if the grid, if the power grid can't handle it, it's not just a matter of you know gaining access to energy, but how do you distribute the energy? How do you get it to the people who need it? Um, and the Russians appear to be continuing to target uh, this, this kind of infrastructure with the goal of bringing it down to 100% um, elimination. Um, I, I think the Russians right now are not in a mood to, um, to have sympathy with anybody in Ukraine at this point in time. Ukraine as a nation has uh, made a decision to uh, participate in a conflict with Russia together with the collective West. Um, and the collective West has said that uh, their goal is to kill as many Russians as possible and to inflict as much harm on the Russian people as possible. If that's your goal, then don't expect the Russian people to have sympathy for what happens to you in response to this. Um, you know, the Russians didn't start this war by shutting out the lights. They didn't start this war by shutting down uh, communications, by cutting off water. That's not what they did. They could have, and indeed, I personally believe should have, <laughs> but Russia has its uh, own approach towards uh, the Ukrainian issue that delves into you know, Russian history and uh, mm -hmm. the notion of Slavic brotherhood and all that, that people like me in the West, I, we, when I say we don't understand, of course, when I hear somebody say, I understand the words that they're saying, but I don't understand the sentiment. I don't understand the, the, the emotional connection that exists because I, I don't share it with them. Um, I believe it's real. Um, but I think Russia is getting beyond that hurdle. And they're in the hurdle of we are going to wage war. And this war is going to hurt you. And um, that's the tragic reality of uh, the, the circumstance in Ukraine today. So you, th th you think, Scott, you think they're going to continue with this until it's 100% destroyed? There's no reason not to. I mean, okay. it makes it makes no sense. Russia is investing a considerable amount of um, resources into targeting this this electric grid, um, precision guided munitions, etc. It makes no sense to expend this this resource only to allow the Ukrainians to rebuild, because then you've wasted 
you've wasted that resource. Once you initiate a campaign of this nature, um, from a military perspective, you need to see it through to the bitter end. And so for every for all the resources that have been expended in order to ensure that they weren't wasted, uh, Russia has to continue this attack to bring the grid down to zero and then to keep it from coming up. Um, otherwise, why are they doing what they're doing? Um, it makes no sense. So now this Crimea talk, and I've heard you in one of the interviews, you said, um, you know, this talk about they want to get back Crimea, etc. This is completely um, delusional, you said, like it's not possible. But I actually, I wonder, that's what I would like to ask you, that bridge that um, went through this terrorist attack, do you think there will be more terrorist attacks on Crimea? How do you see this, um, you know, in the future? With that region is this dangerous place right now because it might be more attacks over there and they will try to have more explosions for example i i think crimea is definitely at risk um i think it's a primary target for the ukrainians um if they can find a way to take down the bridge they will um if they can find the way to do damage to uh crimean civilian infrastructure they will um i i think we're beyond theoretical we're into the ukrainians are act actively trying to carry out these kinds of attacks which is why one russia is putting in place uh, defenses uh, against this um <clears throat> but defenses are never perfect there's always the potential of a defense failing or somebody getting around it etc um, more importantly is the next phase of these combat operations as russia brings into the, the, the region the uh mobilized, partially mobilized uh, troops, 300,000 plus. Um, you know, one of the things the Russians have always said is that they plan on pushing the Ukrainians back so that uh, places like Crimea, Donetsk, Lugansk are out of range of Ukrainian systems. Um, and I think that's what we're going to see uh, is that the Russians are going to focus on moving the Ukrainians away from Crimea, moving them away from Donetsk, moving them away from Zaporizhia. When I say moving them away, uh, killing them, killing them in large numbers, slaughtering the Ukrainian forces. Um, like, a, it, it, this is no longer a special military operation. I know they call it that, but this is mm -hmm. war. Uh, and the Russians are no longer in the business of um, seeking to minimize uh, harm to Ukraine. Russia is in the business of delivering harm to Ukraine. This is going to hurt Ukraine. Um, and it's sad that it's gotten to this stage, but that's where we are. So now this question came. I didn't have it actually here ready for you. From Ukrainian standpoint, when this will be over? That's up to Ukraine. Could end today. Could literally end today. Ukraine could end it today. But they have to be realistic. They can't so sit how, in their fantasy. Sorry, sorry to interrupt you, but how much, how much it has to be destroyed or damaged or weakened for Ukraine to say, this is it? Is there such a point, like from your analysts? If we leave it in the hands of Ukrainian politicians, it'll all be destroyed because they're ultra-nationalists. Uh, the same question could have been asked to Adolf Hitler's inner circle. How much of Germany has to be destroyed before uh, you're willing to surrender? And the answer was all of Germany had to be destroyed. They fought to the bitter end. Um, so when you have these ultranationalists who are influencing Zelensky, who has become himself an ultranationalist, uh, they will fight to the bitter end. The only salvation for Ukraine, I believe, is in its military. Because the military, um, they understand reality. And I'll give you an example. Uh, the, the recent conflict between Armenia and Azerbaijan, the uh, Armenian politicians were insisting on continuing the fight because of the political ramifications of surrendering Nagorno-Karabakh and, and things of that nature. The military stepped in and said, we can't continue the fight. Your words do not translate into military capacity. If we continue to fight, we're all gonna die and the Armenians are gonna take, or the Azerbaijanis are gonna take everything. We need peace now. And the military put, you know, put that reality on the table. Fortunately, the Armenian politicians recognize this reality and succeeded to it. I think in, the, the, in this current situation, at some point in time, the Ukrainian military, uh, who I believe 
you know, they have professional, honorable senior officers um, are, are, are going to wake up to the fact that there is no hope, that there, there is no, we're, you know, next phase where we can attack and push the Russians back. They're going to be looking at the total destruction of the Armenian or of the uh, Ukrainian military. And with it, they're, the total destruction of Ukraine. At some point in time, a Ukrainian general has to say, if we wait for a, a Russian counterattack that is going to take Odessa, Nikolaev, Nipet-Petrovsk, Kharkov, and once they take it, we will never get it back ever, forever. It's gone. That's the end of Ukraine. That's the death of a nation. Do we want that? Uh, because we can't stop that from happening. We're no longer able to look our politicians in the eyes and say, yeah, it'll cost us a lot of manpower, but we can hold them back here. We can counterattack here. We can do this. At some point in time, the Ukrainian generals are going to have to acknowledge that in addition to losing everybody, they're going to lose the territory. Ukraine's going to die. And that at that point in time, a responsible Ukrainian general whose job is the defense of the nation has to say continued resistance doesn't defend the nation it destroys the nation and though we have to stop fighting and if Zelensky doesn't want to listen to them then I think they take Zelensky out of the equation so military doesn't co uh, cooperate or there is not enough men's power because that electric grid will be destroyed a lot of people are leaving they cannot control on the at the borders uh, I mean Right, so there is not enough manpower, Scott. At some point, well, it, it's not that there's not enough manpower. That Ukraine has a lot of manpower left. They're all going to die. There's not enough competent manpower. There's not enough organized manpower. There's not enough trained manpower. There's not enough equipped manpower. There's not enough combat capable manpower. The Ukrainian nation has the ability to mobilize more people. But what's happening now, the, the death rate on the battlefield is a thousand dead a day, a thousand dead a day. Um, and it's going to get worse when the Russians attack. That number is going to go up to potentially four to five thousand dead a day. When the Ukrainian armed forces, when the line breaks, they're in a route and the Russians are mowing them down because they're not in the we're going to they're not going to kill prisoners, but they're not in the mood of taking prisoners. Meaning that um, if you're running away, you know, in the in the past, as Ukraine forces ran away, the Russians would stop firing. Now, as Ukraine forces run away, the Russians are going to pursue and they're going to kill them because they don't want them coming back. They don't want to let them regroup. Um, mm -hmm. and, and once that happens, history, the, you know, the historical example, the uh, destruction of Army Group Center in um, on, on the Eastern Front in 1944, the summer of 1944, when the German Army Group Center collapsed and the route that followed um nearly a million germans were killed because the the russians just overran them slaughtered them um and i unfortunately i see that future for the ukrainian military it's a replay one more question i have for you scott and this is about united states and u.s citizens i would like to know in your opinion what U.S. citizen can do to stop U.S. government to send more money to Ukraine? I mean, we have the theoretical and then we have the reality. The reality is nothing. There's nothing the U.S. citizen can do to stop more money from being sent to Ukraine. Uh, we had our opportunity in the midterm elections, but this wasn't really an uh, issue that was on the ballot. Um, you know, the U.S. citizens didn't allow First of all, I don't know if the majority of U.S. citizens, I know people take polls, but I, I just don't think the average American citizen's waking up every morning going, we got to stop sending money to Ukraine. They're waking up saying, we got to stop inflation. I got to find a way to make my paycheck go further. We got to stop high energy prices. We got to, you know, that's what they're focused on. They're not waking up going, we have to stop spending money in Ukraine. And until they do that, that's, you know, the politicians aren't going to be under any pressure to stop sending money to Ukraine. I know right now you have some uh, Republicans, Marjorie Taylor Greene in the forefront, who are making noise about um, accounting. But here's the question. Is this 
being done because she's really concerned about Ukraine and the money going to Ukraine and the weapons, or is it a political ploy um, where they recognize that there's some weakness on the side of the Democrats, and so they're going to exploit this for their own domestic political benefit? Um, because here's the problem Marjorie Taylor Greene's going to run into. Most Republicans voted to send that money to Ukraine, and they're still in power. So when she calls for an audit, it's not just going to hurt the Democratic Party. It's going to hurt those Republicans who voted in favor of this. So, you know, because that, that's the only way this comes. It, it has to be political pressure. Politicians have to be pressured to act. And I don't believe the American people are mobilized to do that right now. And I don't believe that um, doing the right thing, um, you know, let's say Marjorie Taylor is doing the right thing to try and account for this money. Her party isn't going to support this because it's gonna hurt them as much as it hurts the Democrats when the truth comes out about the amount of money that was sent, the lack of accountability, et cetera. You know, yes, there was a Republican, Rand Paul, who stood up and demanded that there be an inspector general. No other Republicans supported him, none, not in the Senate. So what, now they're all gonna say, oh, we were wrong? No politician likes to admit they were wrong. So I believe that the United States is gonna to continue to double down and, and send you know, billions of dollars of uh, aid to Ukraine, which is why um, Russia has no choice but to finish this conflict violently. And I changed my mind. I have one more question. <laughs> That's your prerogative. <laughs> Thank you. I wonder, what do you think is the next conflict? So what next conflict the collective West will generate after Ukraine? Where? Well, I, I used to be very worried about Taiwan. Um, but I have to say... Um, on November 26, there were the equivalent of midterm elections in Taiwan, and the uh, the ruling party, the DPP, um, I think President Tsai is her name. I apologize if I'm getting that wrong. Um, she made a mistake because she tried to seek a referendum on her cross-strait policy, that is, the policy of Taiwan becoming, um, you know, de facto independent. Uh, it's the same mindset that had Nancy Pelosi travel in August and create this crisis. And uh, I was concerned that um, that this was going to lead to a war very, very soon. And I, and I believe I'm 100 percent correct. I believe the Chinese fed up and they're getting ready to make a military move. Um, and it could have come as soon as this month, maybe early next year. Hmm. And this election came and um, she lost. She made it a referendum on her policies, and she lost. A I mean, the Kuomintang Party, the opposition party, had a near sweep of, uh, of the local election. Um, now, normally, local elections aren't about foreign policy. They're about local issues, corruption, pot boys, and the thing that all local politicians have to deal with when they run. Uh, you know, even in Poland, when you run for mayor of uh, Warsaw, you know, the people aren't asking about you know, NATO policy. They're saying, what are you going to do about, you know, the potholes yeah. in the street? What are you going to do about the homeless? What are you going to do about this? Um, so normally you, 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 that kind of election doesn't have this impact, but she made it a referendum on her policy and she lost. She had to resign as the head of the party. She's still president. She'll be president until 2024. But I believe that we have now, because of this election, the world has been granted a two-year reprieve, two-year reprieve, uh, where... Um, China, because China doesn't want to go to war with Taiwan. China was being compelled to go to war with Taiwan, just like Russia was compelled to go to war with Ukraine because of the actions of the collective West. But I think because China doesn't want war, China is going to back off. I think we're going to have a two-year um, grace period where hopefully reasonable minds can come together so that we don't repeat this scenario in 2024 um, where the crisis elevates. But so I'm taking Taiwan off the, the table mm -hmm. right now. Um, I, 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 for the first time, I feel really good about this. Um, watch, I'm wrong, and we go to war. Uh, that would be tragic, but I don't think I am. I think that this is a, a, a and, and you saw it reflected when um, President Xi met with uh, Biden. Um, the, the Chinese impressed on the United States that uh, the United States has gone too far with its rhetoric and its muscle flexing, and that it was a very, very dangerous situation. And I think the United States at that time was like, yeah, but we, we've committed ourselves politically. I mean, it was tough because you, you lean so far forward supporting Taiwan, you can't back away without hurting Taiwan.
But this election now gives the United States a chance to back, back away without being perceived as weak. And it gives China a chance to back down without being perceived as weak. So I think both sides have an opportunity to separate themselves on this issue and have things calm down, um, which is good because, you know, I know Europe has made a lot of wreck. We, we just had some, you know several people talk about uh, the importance of uh, decoupling Europe from uh, from China. Good luck, Europe. <laughs> you know I mean, the European economy is a basket case, and they're going to decouple from one of their largest trading partners. Insanity. Um, the problem is Europe. The next conflict is going to be a European conflict. That's why I wanted to ask you: Is it is it Serbia? Is it more? I mean, Turkey. Or I wouldn't say, okay, those regions, Serbia, Turkey, Iran. You know, Iran, um, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, Iran has a, a very difficult internal problem right now that's being, I believe, um, exacerbated by Western uh, interference. But um, I think Iran's going to handle this the way they've always handled it, unfortunately, which is brutal repression. And um and, and, and the theocracy will continue to survive. The theocracy has um, pivoted to the East. Iran is no longer playing the European game. And it's gonna be that the divorce is gonna be more complete after this current round of violence because everything that's happening in Iran today is because of Western intelligence um, and, and, and security forces who are uh, providing support to the Kurds, to monarchists, to the Mujahideen al Talk, who are based out of Albania. Um, all of these guys are being uh, supported by the West. And I, I think that um, when the Iranians finish dealing with this issue, they're done with the West. They don't want to have anything to do with the West, and they're, they're going to be pivoting to Russian side. So we, Iran, I don't think, is on the front burner of crises. Uh, Turkey, we'll see about Syria, um, you know, and, and the Kurds. Uh, you know, Russia and Turkey have a very strange relationship. One that um, on the one hand, you'd think they're the worst of enemies with Turkey providing weaponry to Ukraine and uh, Turkey supporting um, Islamic fundamentalists in Idlib province and in, um, in Syria. But on the other hand, um, they, they, you know, they've just entered this deal about an energy hub, the product, you know, mm -hmm. the manufacture of a new uh, uh, line. They're coordinating on uh, grain supplies, fertilizer supplies. They, you know, and they, they, they have a complex relationship. Um, one might call it a mature relationship, but it's, uh, I think it's that nature of the relationship will prevent Turkey from crossing over into extreme conflict. I think the lesson of Ukraine is for most people, war is hell. I mean, it's being driven home how bad it is, but not bad enough. See, the problem to me is Serbia is a dangerous situation, very dangerous situation, but I, do, I don't think the Serbs are insane. I don't think the Serbs want conflict. The Serbs know what conflict is and Serbs understand that uh, uh, you know a, a conflict with NATO and in Europe will only hurt Serbia. Um, so I think the Serbs are going to be the mature party in the in the in the struggle with you know the Kosovars and, and also in Bosnia with the Bosnia Serb issue. So I'm I'm not fearful of that. I mean, there's always a chance that the Kosovars will overplay their hand and promote provoke a conflict, believing that NATO's there to back them up. To me, the two hot spots, two, the, the most dangerous places in Europe today, are Moldova. And Western Ukraine. Um, I'm very concerned about Polish ambitions in Western Ukraine. Um, I mean, I, I I I think people are starting to wake up to the fact we've talked about this before, but there's tens of thousands of Polish military personnel in Ukraine today. They're volunteers or they're whatever you want to call them, but they're Polish military people who have been allowed to go into Ukraine wearing the Ukraine uniform. Um, they're dying in large numbers, by the way. I mean, you know, Poles have to understand that there's thousands of caskets coming home. Aren't there new cemeteries? Aren't the Polish people aware of the fact that there's a lot of dead Polish soldiers being put into the ground? And there's going to be even more when this conflict erupts. But the danger 
is, see, I don't believe that the Poles put those troops in Ukraine to die. I think they put them in Ukraine for two things. One, to get combat experience, to learn how to fight. Because with all due respect to the Polish military, you don't know how to fight. When was the last major war Poland was in? You know, nobody in their current, they have some limited experience in Iraq, some limited experience in Afghanistan, perhaps. But other than that, there's no combat experience in Poland. They're now getting tens of thousands of men combat experience on the front line, learning how to fight Russians. That's a very valuable thing. Two, if and when the time comes when Poland says, we want Western Ukraine, they can flip a switch. They don't have to deploy troops into Western Ukraine. They have them there already. And they flip a switch, they become Polish. And it's like a, you know, confronting the Russians with de facto. I think it's lunacy because all that's going to happen now is that mm -hmm. instead of killing uh, Polish soldiers disguised as Ukrainians on Ukrainian soil, the Russians will just shift to killing Polish soldiers on Ukrainian soil. Um, and NATO isn't going to back Poland up. NATO isn't going to support this gambit. But I think the Poles, together with the, um, the Baltic states, are um, irresponsibly desperate enough to undertake this. So that's that's a problem. There's some speculation, I, I don't want to give too much credence to it, that um, one of the moves Russia might make with its uh, with these new forces is to actually drive out of Belarus and seal off the Polish-Ukrainian border. Um, I personally don't think that's a, that, that creates a second front. Logistical supplies are difficult. Um, Lvov is a difficult target. Uh, I, I, I think, I don't believe it, but I mean, it, it the fact that you have the head of the Russian intelligence talking about Poland wanting to take over Western Ukraine, you have a military buildup there. It's a dangerous situation, a very dangerous situation. The other one is uh, Transnistria and Moldova. Moldova is making more and more talk about, um, because again, their president is under tremendous political pressure. There's massive demonstrations in the streets of the Moldovan capital, asking, demanding uh, her resignation, demanding new elections, et cetera. Uh, they're not, they're not happy with her uh, you know, aggressive anti-Russian posture. Uh, and she's saying that um, the Transnistria, the breakaway uh, republic, um, has to be reabsorbed and the ammunition that's there, the old Soviet era ammunition, has to be done away with, removed. Uh, Ukrainians are starting to talk about why do we tolerate this, this pro-Russian enclave on our border? Why don't we just attack it and get rid of it, eliminate it? Romania is a flexing muscle saying that they would support Moldova. Um, and Russia is physically separated from Transnistria. So there's some people who might be thinking this is the time to act. And all they're going to do is guarantee that the Russians will move through Odessa and confront them there. And now we have an expanded war um, that goes into Moldova, dangerously could bring in Romania, Russian NATO conflict. Um, and so those are the two things that keep me up, um, Transisteria and Western Ukraine. Those are where I think the next uh, hot spots, danger spots, uh, with the potential of expanding the current conflict could come from. Horrifying, Scott. Yeah, it is. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming on today. To those of viewers who wonder why I'm all of a sudden in the dark, because it's not energy saving, actually. I know it's not funny, but it's just the rooms have this light that they switch off by itself. So that's what happened. But uh, yeah, I'm actually leaving Poland um, in two days for some time. I don't know for how long, but I will be still recording the videos and still absolutely following um, the informations and the updates since I know the language. And it's very important to, to do that. Um, thank you so much, Scott, for finding time today and you're on the travel. So I appreciate this very, very much. Um, the links to find you will be down below this video. Anything you want to add before we disconnect or? Oh, good is... luck with your, with your travels. I hope uh, everything goes well, stay safe. And uh, I look forward to talking to you the next time. Thank you so much. Thank you guys for watching and we see you soon next time.